All right. Hello, Carol. Thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We're, we're talking about your book, T, and we finally were able to link up. And I mentioned this, I mentioned this in something I wrote the other day, but even my girlfriend, like, she was like, that woman, Carol, sounds pretty nice and awesome. Aww. And I'm like, I'm like, you know what? She is because, yeah, we were having scheduling conflicts and all that. But uh, I know uh, you've, you've, you've gained a lot of popularity this year. But for those who don't know you, can you give us a little of what you do, what you research, and what is this book, T? about i can but i want you to promise me that we're all going to be able to see your chin there you go all right thank you <laughs> there we go thank you okay so um what is the book of what do you want me to start with what is the book about for those who have not read it what is the read book it? about so that's great i'm glad you asked that because sometimes people just forget about the book and go right into the uh juicy stuff <laughs> Yeah, so the book is about the hormone testosterone. It's a reproductive hormone. And the book is about how it shapes males and females across the animal kingdom. But mm -hmm. the perspective is to look at humans as animals and to understand how testosterone operates in our species to create mm -hmm. some of the, or contribute to some of the sex differences that we see in boys and girls and men and women. And to understand how that works and how it starts in utero, you know, mm -hmm. almost from conception, from really early on, we have sex differences in testosterone levels that shape our brains and our bodies and set us up for uh, the ability to maximize reproductive success, right? To convert energy into offspring and males and females need to use different strategies to do that. And testosterone helps male animals to do that in the ways that make sense for them. And this happens in humans and non-human animals. And what's interesting, obviously, about us is that we have this incredibly complex culture with that is highly gendered, right? So we have these important uh, genetic, you know, evolutionary genetic hormonal influences on our behavior that contribute to sex differences in behavior, but it's interacting with this complex culture. And we want to understand how those interactions work and how we can just understand the world around us that is so gendered. Why is it this way? What mm -hmm. is this hormone doing mostly in male humans? And uh, how can we understand its actions that help us understand the patterns that we observe in the world, like, you know, higher levels of physical aggression among mm -hmm. men. That's something that's really important that we need to understand. And through understanding this hormone, you know, and, and, differences in sexuality, for instance, understanding the hormone gives us a huge amount of insight into those questions. So basically that is what the book is about. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're the perfect person to ask this. This is one of the reasons I, I was having to talk with you. So I, I am a huge psychology nerd, right? Like something like my girlfriend laughs because I, I hate, I, I don't hate I'm not a huge fan of all the research we do about space and like galaxies and stuff. I'm like, do you know how much stuff is going on right here? Like we barely understand why we do the stuff we do. Let's focus on us. But anyways, I'm, I'm, you know, I started being really interested in like psychology and just human behavior. And, you know, I really got into like just irrationality and stuff. When I had the internet coming after me, I'm like, why do people do what they do? So anyways, yeah. I love psychology. My background's like kind of in mental health and stuff like that. But anyway, just interject. I have to interject. Yes. For yeah. So I was a psych major as an undergrad because I was interested in the same kind of questions as you are. After that, when I started learning about learning about neurons and neurotransmitters and the brain in my senior year in college, that's when I really got interested in science and evolutionary biology. But that's also when I started to get interested in outer space <laughs> and in like the driving principles that shape the universe and what yeah. is gravity and how does it shape our lives. So these, you know, it took me to this place like evolutionary biology is a way that is a tool we can use to understand these influences that we don't appreciate that are operating in us all that are so fundamental to our daily lives like gravity i just find fascinating because it shapes almost every aspect of our lives but we never sort of stop to think about exactly yeah. what is this and how does it work and i see evolutionary uh pressures that sculpt us and the mechanisms sort of the ev evolution shaped to that mold our behavior as something very similar to these deep laws of the universe, you know, that once you expose them, it really becomes fascinating. And you could see, hey, maybe it could have been some other way, mm -hmm. but it's this way for very good 
reasons. Sorry, I just went off on a tangent, but no, I just wanted that, to- No, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly kind of what I was going to ask. And you, you yes. answered a little bit. I'm like, you know, I, 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 aside from just liking to, or, you know, loving to learn about different topics, I'm really curious because I talk with so many different academics and stuff and authors. And I'm like, what, what made you interested in this specific field? So, you know, with, with your, you know, background, like, you know, studying psychology and stuff, I'm, I'm curious. So for example, Right. You were you were talking about, you know, testosterone and us trying to understand like male aggression and stuff like recently I had David Buss on here. Right. Yeah. And he takes that evolutionary sexual psychology aspect. And, yeah. you know, I, I'm curious, you know, why why do you want to go deeper? Like, is there anything is there anything science can help us understand about testosterone that will help shape like the psychology like what's the what's the goal the interaction you know what I mean like understanding yeah, it I do yeah where does that lead no and I'm glad that's a nice kind of segue because I can when I was just taking psychology in college I found it really interesting but I wanted something deeper and more powerful. It, I, I wasn't quite satisfied with the psychological with explanations that didn't get at why, what is the ultimate mechanism? What are the ultimate forces that explain these observations? And I have not found anything more powerful and satisfying than evolutionary biology, because it, there's a reason, there's always a reason in our evolutionary history um, that selects for genes that we carry that help us reproduce. We carry the genes of our successful ancestors, right? They were all reproductively yeah. successful. What traits did they have, physical and behavioral? Behavior, behavior all goes through the nervous system, right? And the nervous system and behavior has to be coordinated with our reproductive traits, the, the um, like having a penis or a vagina or a you know, prostate or a uterus, all that stuff, or making sperm or making eggs, right? If you're an animal that makes sperm, you have to have a way to get the sperm into basically a female's reproductive tract, right? If you're mm -hmm. a mammal. And so what is the system that can both um, guide the, the development of the system that enables that animal to produce the sperm, maintain that sperm production, and have the motivation to, as it turns out, compete for the ability to get that sperm into a female reproductive tract, right? Just to yeah. put it crudely, to reproduce. So the, there is one hormone that is in fact evolution's tool, it's sexual selection's tool to help male animals reproduce to coordinate the behaviors and the anatomy and physiology necessary to maximize their ability to convert the energy they get from the environment into offspring. Because mm -hmm. that is just what evolution does in all animals is it um, motivates them and shapes them in ways that enable to do that as effectively as possible. Mm -hmm. So just to go back to the original question, there's no deeper explanation for me about human behavior than that. And the reason the sex hormones are interesting is because I'm interested in sex and, you know, who isn't, right? And, and um, sex differences. I'm, you know, as somebody who's interested in human behavior, it's fa male behavior is fascinating to me because I'm not in there. I'm not in your <laughs> yeah. brain. I don't know what it's like. So as someone who, where that's my primary motivation to understand behavior, I kind of get female behavior. I'd like to, you know, I, I learn as much as I can about it, but I'm much more fascinated by male behavior because it's different mm. and I want to explain it. And I find no better way to explain it than through the lens of evolution, specifically sexual selection, understanding humans as animals. What do we share with non-human animals? What do we not share? How does, how is the environment involved here? Um, so yeah, testosterone to me is the, the most powerful way to do that and understanding how it interacts with the environment to shape mm -hmm. the big patterns of behavior that we see. So here's a random question that I didn't even yeah. have down in my notes, but as you say that, like, right, like you're not in, you know, the male brain, you're more, you know, familiar. So have you ever, or do you ever, or maybe you do this when you're lecturing, ever done like a dating workshop for like women to help them understand men and how testosterone is making us do the, the things that we're doing? 
Um, I have not. Ah, could <laughs> but, be the next book. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's interesting. We don't want to forget about non-heterosexual relationships mm, yes. and orientations because that's really important too. And I do, I just want to give a shout out to the importance of understanding same sex relationships and patterns of attraction, partly because it reveals a lot about heterosexual relationships. When mm -hmm. you look at the sort of sexual and mating and relationship ship dynamics in, you know, female, female couples and female, male couples, we can see these real differences in expectations and behavior on average. And that tells us a lot about uh, mm -hmm. who we are as males and females um, in heterosexual relationships. So yeah. That's an and you know, that, that segues perfectly into another question I have, and you discuss this in the book and we'll, we'll jump back to childhood in a minute. Right. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm personally someone who I grew up around like a lot of gay men because my mom, her best friends were gay men and stuff like that. And, you know, there's always just the, the, dumb, the dumb argument around like, is homosexuality a choice? Is it not? And all that kind of stuff. And you discuss some of this in the book, but like, as you're mentioning, you know, male and male, you know, relationships, female, and female. And then I, I think about, you know, testosterone and aggression, but when, you know, there's, there's, you know, uh, high domestic violence rates between, you know, lesbian couples. And I'm wondering, you know, and then like we see traits of like femininity in some men, you know, who are gay. And I'm like, how much does testosterone affect these or is it more nurture or lay it out there? Like help me understand. So how does testosterone that. affect what? Those relationships, right? So, like for example, yeah. if we're if we just focused on uh, domestic violence in females, right, and you know, in female couples, has is there any research that shows like a higher level of testosterone compared to like estrogen, or like what what would you say is that? Okay, so first of all, um, I'm familiar with the literature on. Um, domestic violence and sex differences in rates and types of domestic violence. Mm. Uh, I know that there's a higher rate in um, homosexual male couples. I am yeah, not familiar with the li mm. literature showing that there's a higher rate and I'd be interested in that. I'm not sure why I wouldn't have come across that, but um, in lesbian couples, you're saying there's a higher rate than what? Yeah. Then just average like for example i i was gonna ask you too like i've been yeah. i've been in abusive relationships back in my addiction i had a real good radar for finding just abusive women right so <laughs> there was there's some like violence and things like that and i'll have to look up the uh the stats i i, I think it was within the last couple of years and i'll email it to you if i can but it was talking about high domestic violence rates and maybe it was in both same-sex couples that yeah. could be what it was because I do know about like domestic violence rates within men. And that makes sense to me because you got two people with high testosterone levels. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but here's a, here's a better question. Not but I'm sorry. I can't, oh, I just pause ahead. for a second mm -hmm. because you mentioned that you were in, and I'm sorry to hear this, um, that you were in an abusive relationship where the woman was the abuser. Yeah. Multiple. Okay. So that's <laughs> unpopular for you to say. And I got some pushback in the writing uh, and editing process of my book because really? I, I quote that data that it's true um, that it, and of course there's huge cross-cultural variation here because in some cultures it's, it's expected that men will be abusive towards mm -hmm. physically abusive towards their um, partners and that women will not be able to even defend themselves. And um, say in the United States and in Europe, the rates of female um, interpersonal violence are as high many times or almost as high as the rates of male interpersonal violence. Mm -hmm. And it's my view that this needs more attention. It's underappreciated and people, because people don't like to hear it because they think it then takes the attention away from the more important yeah. uh, ostensibly problem of um, male on female violence. And it is, so what's interesting is that, yes, there's like women are more likely to uh, use low level physical aggression against their partners, but definitely physical aggression, huge immense amounts of anger, punching, kicking, throwing things, even stabbing sometimes, or, or even shooting mm -hmm. or, and sometimes killing. 
but however, many times that's um, in response, you know, it's in self-defense in response yeah. to male abuse, but many times it's not. But the, the really interesting statistic is that men are much more likely to seriously injure or murder mm -hmm. women, their partners. So far more women die at the hands of their male partner than mm -hmm. men would die or be seriously injured, uh, injured by their female partner. And that's where there does seem to be a role of testosterone because there is some evidence that, uh, well, obviously the sex difference in, in extreme physical aggression is present across all cultures and humans, and it's present in non-human animals. Male animals mm -hmm. tend to be more physically violent than female animals because it yields reproductive benefits for them, especially in male-male competition. And there's some evidence that high, that male typical levels of testosterone tend to reduce uh, empathy and that it's then mm. easier for men to escalate to serious physical aggression during a physical conflict where women are more likely to be inhibited and really causing serious damage. But I wasn't, so the lesbian couple thing is interesting. If that's the case, that might be the case and I'm just not familiar with it. There is some evidence that um, aggression in adults is not conditioned just based on current testosterone levels in adulthood, mm. but by exposure to testosterone in utero. And there's some evidence that people who grow up to, women who grow up to be non-heterosexual have uh, some evidence suggests they had higher levels of testosterone in utero. Um, yeah. That's not like the clearest finding on the planet, but there's some suggest in there. Suggestion. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I can go on a, a rant about where where we have these larger issues right such as like you know male on you know female violence like it is it's insane like the domestic violence where you know men are the you know aggressor and things like that many times women are in self-defense and stuff but you know just me right you want to get into the the male brain like i don't i don't talk about it because i don't want to take away from that but it's oh oh but you, is, it happened to you yeah <laughs> so, no that's yeah. your experience i hope that you wouldn't inhibit that that's something that needs that we need oh, attention yeah. on that issue it's important yeah it but have you noticed this uh you know because it it comes up with uh you know the trans conversations and everything too because for example uh, uh the other day i was having a conversation or you know even a debate with somebody about you know people who detransition right yeah. it's a my it's a very they they're like well this is just a small small portion we need to focus on you know this and but for all of these things it's like okay well can we can we talk about both like even though one is less that's or right. less prevalent than the other and you know we we yeah, that's important too i interview a deep transitioner uh mm -hmm. in my book and mm -hmm. you know people i i haven't had any real complaints about that but there was also during the writing process and the editing there was a fear that this would kind of suggest that i'm anti-trans right that you're not allowed to talk about this one thing because it'll invalidate this other thing and I'm, you know, like you, I think we should be able to talk about it all. And this is a reality and this happens not that often. Most people are happy with their transitions, but that's, those are stories that I think need to be heard. And yeah. it's also just from a testosterone point of view, fascinating for me, you know, as someone who really wants to understand more about it, what's it like to go from a female level to a male level and live yeah. that way for a while and not just report on it after you've transitioned and you're living as a male, right? With high testosterone, but to reflect on it after you come back to living as a female with female levels and then to talk about it, you know? So I think yeah. that's- No, that, that, yeah, especially from like a science perspective, right. like you're like, hmm, you know, but, uh, you know, and you're, you're such, you are just the best because you have psychology and biology right here. And I, like, so I'm always wondering about nature versus nurture and stuff. And you talk about this a little bit in the book, right? Where you know, uh, how, how kids develop, right? And like, boys are gonna play with trucks and be rough and tumble and all this, and girls are gonna, you know, but you talk about like, is this, is this us pushing gender norms on kids? And, you know, they've done that research where you hand somebody a baby and make them think it's a girl and they treat them a different way and, you know, all this stuff. And you talk about this in the book, but like, uh, help, help me understand a little bit more and those who have yet to read the book, uh, yeah. like how much, how much is that shaped by environment versus testosterone levels. Yeah, no, right? great. I'm glad you brought up the experiments with the baby. So it is a fact that people do. I'm sure that I do this. Um, and, you know, people say that they they don't treat anybody differently based on their sex, but that it's almost impossible not to. Yeah. Um, 
or, or a million other different characteristics about people, whether they're tall, short, male, female, black, yeah. white, I mean, all these things contribute right to how we respond to people. You almost can't help it. So if you um, believe that a baby, you know, dress it up like a boy, people react uh, to that baby in a different way. They are a little, you know, a bit rougher with it than they would be if they think it's a girl baby. They use different tones mm -hmm. of voice. They say different words and it's only a baby. So, you know, and, and I think most people can imagine that, yeah, that's probably true. But what then most people also imagine is that's what causes, it's that differential treatment that explains the differences in childhood behavior because the world is so gendered. Uh, so I just, so there is no evidence for point B, right? There's evidence for um, testosterone and gene, mostly testosterone actually uh, acting in the brain in utero in ways that promote male typical behavior. Mm. And male typical behavior is basically more physical. It's more active and more physical. And that's, again, the reason that I can say this is that it's not just the way that people interact with the babies is because I have a use a comparative, you know, broad evolutionary comparative perspective. The sex differences that we see in boys and girls are paralleled in many ways. I spent eight months with chimpanzees in Uganda before I came to Harvard for my PhD. And you can see the huge sex differences in the chimps, in the juveniles and in the adult, adults, that in its most basic form, in terms of nurturing and physical play and aggression, you know, have these very strong parallels with human behavior. That's not because they live in a culture that is intentionally gendered. It's just nature. It is uh, little male juveniles are have to... Uh, be motivated to practice the behaviors that they need to be reproductively su successful mm -hmm. as adults. So I have a 12 year old boy. He likes to tackle other kids. I mean, he's doing less of that now, but that's what he did growing up. He's not even like an athletic, you know, kid. He's a kind of an artsy bookworm, but nonetheless, yeah. he loves <laughs> just jumping all over his friends and girls do not typically play this way with other girls. They have other things that they like to play. <laughs> so when you see the same patterns in non-human animals, you have an ex evolutionary explanation for it. You know, it's stat, it's practicing physical status competition. It has to be fun. You have mm -hmm. to work it out. How do you relate to other male members of your own species in ways that you can, you know, be physical, uh, understand the signals that you have to respond to about dominance and hierarchy, and it has to be fun. And so it's play. Yeah. And we know that in non-human animals, when you manipulate testosterone, in utero or directly uh, after birth, you can then also change the expression of that behavior. You can masculinize mm. it or feminize it, right? Just based on early testosterone exposure. And we have evidence from humans in um, when fetuses are, female fetuses are exposed to unusually high levels of testosterone in a condition mm -hmm. called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, those girls engage in more rough and tumble play. They like, you know, they're more likely to want to play with the kinds of toys that boys play with. And that's only due to this early uh, testosterone exposure that is usually corrected at birth. So we have all kinds of evidence that is hormonal and like a pretty solid evolutionary theory there that shows why these sex differences make sense and are not simply a product of cultural conditioning. Mm -hmm. That being said, you can budge the expression of those behaviors around uh, by changing cultural, you know, depending on cultural norms, right? So in some mm -hmm. cultures, they're much more sexually differentiated. There's much more traditional gender roles. You're going to see greater division of these behaviors. And in other cultures that are more flexible, you'll see less uh, division between the sexes. You'll see more overlap. But overall, you'll never see girls doing more of that kind of physical play than boys. You'll never see women committing more physical violence and aggression than men anywhere. Although the mm -hmm. type of uh, expression of, you know, the exact way that that is expressed and the degree, the amount of the sex difference, of course, is going to vary tremendously based on mm -hmm. like laws and customs and religion, et cetera. Yeah. And, and I, I uh, yeah, now I remember our, our sons are the same age and I, right. I think I can. Could... Oh, and he just got, did some national honor society thing. Yeah, he just happened? got a national junior honor society. <laughs> right. Ooh. Yeah. He Congratulations. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I, uh, with what you were saying too, like I, I get curious because he is he's this sweet, compassionate little boy, right? And like uh, I've never been 
typically masculine. I played sports throughout high school, but I don't watch sports. I don't do anything. I'm sober now, so I'm not out drinking brews with the buds and stuff like that. But my son, like, he went through like a whole like unicorn phase and everything like that. And, yeah. and he's into that. And he likes, you know, he likes drawing. But like you said, like he's a gamer. And when he gets in there, you see that kind of male aggression come out. And it's, it's wow. interesting just, you know, looking and watching and, you know, uh, you know, and I've always said, like, I don't care how he turns out if he ends up you know uh uh you know being gay and liking men or if he ends up with a different political ideology than me as long as he's not a dick i really don't care right no, as long as i just say i feel exactly the same way my son went through a period where he used to wear a dress he wore a dress to school and i was like fine just as long as it's clean and you look nice and yeah that's point one like yeah who cares and uh but point two is the kid who wore a dress for a while is the kid who is pouncing on uh his friends and i should also just say that that behavior that like typically masculine behavior boys who grow up to be gay are much less likely to show that particular kind of behavior so i just want to emphasize that you mm -hmm. know there's a huge amount of variation and boys who grow up to be gay are more likely to want to play with and like the girls, you know, yeah. so it's, there's like a, a lot of variation. This is just on average what we see in. in yeah. Time. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's what I was thinking the whole time when you were talking to it is on average. And like you mentioned, that's there's certain things that's that can happen in utero and all that. But so one of the, one of the things that's going on, you know, with, uh, you know, just, I don't know, uh, just certain parents becoming very, I don't know, different and trying to change these gender norms and stuff. Here's okay. what I'm wondering as I'm listening, right? Like there's been like stories about like, oh, we're raising our kid non-binary or Maybe. yeah, yeah, right? And yeah. so I see that or like we're, we're, or, you know, there's a lot of controversy around like raising their male child as a girl. So like, I, I guess my, there's two questions, right? Would that work right could the psychology of that overpower you know the the hormones and all that kind of stuff and let's say let's say this became more popular down the line in evolution would that change kind of how testosterone does its thing yeah think? okay basically i would say no <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, i would just say no um but what i do think is that that's totally the right idea, we, sh you know, I think gender norms should be relaxed as much as possible. Yeah. I personally wish that we didn't have to label every possible way that those people break out of traditional gender norms. I wish that there were just more flexibility for people to be who they are, right? And uh, so that is my personal view. Of course, you know, there's again huge amount of cultural, religious variation mm -hmm. in all of that. I do not think that and okay and gay kids are the a perfect example so in many parts of the world it is not okay to be an a, a, a adult gay person yeah. and it's not okay for little boys for instance especially for little boys it's okay for girls to behave in very masculine ways because men have the power and that's uh in many societies it's perfectly fine if a girl wants to go and be stronger and, mm -hmm. and more powerful Although it can be also very awkward, I just should interject, for some girls who are going to grow up to be lesbians to feel that they don't fit in with other girls. So mm -hmm. that applies to sort of pre-gay uh, girls too. But for boys in particular, who have been called, you know, used to be called sissies, or, you know, I would say are gender non-conforming, <clears throat> in many families, they are positively punished for those behaviors, right? Yeah. So the social pressures, the cultural pressures, the religious pressures are enormous, right? Mm. Those kids, can, they might fake in various ways trying to act like the other boys and like they love sports and like they're tough. And that's, I can hardly talk about that. It's so heartbreaking mm -hmm. that someone feels ashamed for who they are in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it does, sorry, it does, it does illustrate that uh, people are going to be who they are. They have yeah. their natures. That's a basic nature. We can change our behavior. We can change how we express our nature. Sometimes we're just not allowed to, right? Especially if you have a propensity for physical aggression, right? You can't yeah. always express that. I don't want to equate that to gender nonconformity, but it's the same idea of, you know, culture can nudge around the expression of your nature, but your nature is always going to be there no matter how 
heavy the pressure coming from the culture is, how awful or difficult uh, it might be. You know, and yeah. ideally we relax those norms, we let people grow into whoever uh, they're going to be. Yeah, yeah. And for some reason, I was just thinking uh, there was all that, you know, stuff about Harry Styles recently where he like wore a dress. I'm like, I'm like, what about like the people in Scotland? Like that's tradition, like wearing kilts and stuff. Like just let people wear whatever and, you know. Let oh yeah, wear whatever. Stuff. And I, But I do, <laughs> I do wish that people could do that and didn't feel that they had to become something else uh, mm -hmm. or relabel themselves. I wish they could, that yeah. ultimately we get to a place where there's just total flexibility and acceptance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's and not where we are now, obviously. and here, here's the thing, and like, <laughs> uh, you know, just it, it's it's crazy. Let me let me ask you let me ask you this real quick. I'll form it like this. Like, I want to know I want to know about you know the experience with people reading the book because as I'm reading this book, right? So whenever books are coming out and there's like hype and stuff, I, I talked with this about uh, with Paige Harden just like yeah. a week or two ago, like because she had that big New Yorker piece and people yeah. are losing their minds. I got an early copy of the book. Like, I talked with publishers. I got an early copy. I read it cover to cover. I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, cool, right? And before reading your book, I was very late on the train to reading your book because I'm not huge into like books on like biological stuff but i'm yeah. like this seems like an interesting book and you did a great job educating a non-biology guy like me oh, thank you but anyways i have to ask like i i read the book and and you know you you talk about like from childhood and you talk about you know in college you talk about uh you know a student who came up to you and uh, i believe there were intersex and stuff like that and anyways just to flatter you a little bit i'm like this woman carol is a kind compassionate caring person and i will fight anybody who says that she like you know is like transphobic or whatever and that so i'm i'm curious as an author i'm always wondering how many people do you think have been pissed off that didn't even read the book well i would say the people who are pissed off did not read the book like um so i don't think it's the book that piss people off. It's me going on Fox News and saying that there are two sexes, <laughs> sexes defined by your gametes, and that this really has no impact on our support for the rights of trans people and respecting gender identities and gender expression. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I think that's, you know, just to be completely out about it, that is what upset people, uh, upset some people, like a small, very, well, maybe more people than I know about, but um, it's it's contrary to what people how people want to have some people want to have conversations about some sensitive issues right now and i'm not uh going along with maybe what some people how some people want that conversation to go like in the book what i do is really stick up for science and i try to show mm -hmm. that we can discuss the science openly we should be learning about reality and that we can use that understanding to be more compassionate people, to understand people who are different from us, mm -hmm. even to understand some of the problems that men face in uh, their behavior and to even have some compassion for, you know, all kinds of struggles uh, by, by learning more about how things work. And I, so, so I can't even remember exactly what you asked, but you, yeah, basically are people pissed off. <laughs> yeah. No, it's some people, you know, they want, they do have a certain narrative. And if that narrative is really contrary to the science, then I, I'm going to push back and I'm going to try to do it in a way that shows that it doesn't interfere with our support of all kinds of human rights. And in fact, the best way to support human rights for all kinds of people is to have them be based on reality and good science. And that's how we make progress. And I just wanna show that we don't have to twist around scientific facts and confuse people yeah. to have empathy and compassion for people who are different and suffering be, you know, because of those differences. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, you know, I, I'm often thinking about how much fear there is, right? Like I don't necessarily, you know, think it's like people have a problem with the science. It's the fear. Like, for example, when I was talking with Paige Harden, like I think like books like yours, her book, like her book is like, yo, all this stuff that people misunderstand about genetics are affecting social outcomes, right? And I'm like, yeah, we have massive problems with 
racism, sexism, with, uh, you know, wealth inequality and people not understanding luck versus, you know, and all, and all these things, right? And I look at yours and I'm thinking about how we're trying to, you know, progress the science and we're looking at, you know, more people transitioning and the best thing we could do is understand this stuff so we can have safer, better things. And I'm, so I, when I look at it like that, I'm, I'm like, this is helping. And maybe I, I was just thinking as you were talking to, I wonder if it comes from my addiction background, because for lack of better words, like I just thought I was a piece of shit. Right. And as I started to learn about the science and genetic components and, you know, growing up in a household with an alcoholic mom, I'm like, thank God some people research this stuff. So yeah. I have better answers. And I, yeah. you know, uh, because there's uh, scientific research around evidence based therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy and stuff like that, I cannot waste my time on BS. So anyways, science is very helpful. So when I look at it, I'm like, what, what is the issue? And it seems like fear, like a lot of it is fear, right? So with genetics, it's like people are afraid that, you know, uh, the next Hitler's going to come out and want to wipe out people and, you know, and all this stuff. But with your, with your area of expertise, it seems like a lot of fear, right? So with, with you, you know, being asked to come on like things like Fox News, I, I see people being afraid that you're gonna you're gonna give weapons to the alt right or some crazy politician, yeah. and so how much of this do you think is based around fear? Not the yeah, science, 100%, but the fear. Hundred percent. Everyone is scared. Uh, no, they are. I'm exp I'm right in the middle of it. People make decisions about language, about what they're gonna say, about what they're gonna study, what they're gonna teach, out of fear. Um, so that's from one side of it, right? People are scared and I do not blame them because being the target of some campaign to have your you know, character and motives completely slammed rather than engaging in your science and your arguments, it's awful because that's not how I feel. Like I, students who take my class are students who wanna learn about themselves. I've had a bunch of trans kids. I have a lot of gay kids. I have questioning kids. I, you know, all kind of students who want the science. So my chapter on the trans chapter, as you saw, it's pretty deep. The science in there is pretty detailed. I mm -hmm. want people who have gender dysphoria, who are thinking of puberty blockers, who are on testosterone, on estrogen, blocking it. You know, I want them to really understand what is happening and yeah. why and what other people's experiences are. And that's a resource for them. And I, you're right, people, I don't want to patronize anybody by saying, oh, I'm going to tell you this little story um, so that you <laughs> feel better about yourself. And so that you can then hope that the rest of the world is going to support your rights. And I'm going to kind of tell you something that's not really true, or I'm going to withhold the truth. No, I know because I teach my students, they want to learn how the science works. They can handle it. They are able to deal with some degree of discomfort and even offense. They enjoy the process of sort of having to work through what they believe and what their reactions are and to push back. And mm -hmm. that all comes into the classroom and that's okay. And they can handle that. And disagreement's okay. You know, uh, we have to learn how to look at the evidence and think about what it means. So um, and there was one other point I wanted to make about your question, and now I forgot it. Um, We're going to be talking about fear for a little bit, so if it comes <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah, no, the other side of it, yeah. I mean, it's fear on the, you know, language, idea, talking out loud in public side, which is obviously too bad because what we teach and what we say and even what we think should be in response to rational discourse and logical thinking and having your ideas challenged and coming to reasoned, thoughtful, considered decisions rather than passively accepting whatever the current trends and pressures are because you're scared shitless. Mm -hmm. But again, it's correct that fear is correct because it, people will try to ruin your reputation. Okay, so there's yeah. that. But then I also understand the fear that vulnerable people face who have difficult lives because of their differences. They, I told, I mean, I can really see why some of those people want to direct a certain narrative because they think it's going perhaps to protect them, right? So there are different, every, nobody's just, I don't think, purposely being unreasonable or yeah. causing harm. You know, I think everyone thinks they're doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, 
but my number one priority is, you know, good science with sensitive as with as much sensitivity as possible. And uh, I think that's doing a service, you know, is mm -hmm. trying to produce and communicate the truth. Like, let's figure out how things work and let's help yeah. people figure out how to use those facts to improve not only their lives, but socially, how can we use scientific information to improve everybody's lives? I just don't see any other way to go. Shutting down conversation, twisting scientific facts. People aren't taking their vaccines, for instance, because yeah. nobody trusts science. People are literally dying because of you know, political divisions and the fact that science has become so politicized. I'm really pushing back on that. Yeah. And, uh, it's not healthy. People are dying. So yeah. I think we need to get back, or I don't know if we were ever there, but I think we are in a, in a precarious point here. Yeah, like, you know, it, it's it's crazy. And as you're talking about, I'm, I'm thinking about all this stuff, like there have been, you know, there's been like legislation that's had to be created. For example, like during uh, clinical trials for medications, like you have to have, or uh, yeah, like in a bunch of stuff, you have to have informed consent, right? Like, so me as somebody who has struggled with depression and anxiety, and I was a prescription opioid addict, right? I have had to educate myself on side effects of taking this depressant so I can weigh my pros and cons, right? One of the reasons that the opioid crisis has spun out of control and we just hit record numbers of overdose deaths is because doctors and people like Purdue Pharma were not giving people the proper scientific right. information. Like, oh, no, 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 these people aren't opioid addicts. That's a, that's a pseudo addiction, right? And if we shut down conversation, people, people who do have bad intentions can yeah. easily start covering stuff up for profit yeah. and all these things. And I, I, I just, I just want people to understand that. Right. And we need to dial back our fear a little bit, but here's my question too. Yeah, but it's hard. That's oh. hard. People are scared for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, it's something I try to remember, like I, I try to be, you know, empathetic of that fear and stuff like that. But I, I have this kind of faith that, you know, especially reading books about why we need to have these discussions and free speech yeah. and all that, because I do believe that good ideas do win out when we're not censoring. And, you know, we have a bunch of stuff to fix with social media algorithms, and how it spreads nonsense and keeps people in echo chambers. But anyways, now I want to talk about the other fear, though, not like the fear from, you know, people who like from the trans community and stuff like that. But there's it seems like there's also a lot of fear from the other side right so when we're talking about men and aggression and stuff yeah. like that okay, something yeah. i've something i've heard recently <laughs> that's come up quite a bit is uh trans women going into female prisons right i also have a friend who one runs a women's shelter here in las vegas right and one of the fears is well if we let anybody identify as trans all willy-nilly and stuff like that uh, you know, um, they can abuse women and get access to women. And there's been, you know, I was watching something the other day about instances of a trans woman raping women in a women's prison, right? So, you know, I think, you know, I, a lot of this stuff, we have to look at statistics as we can get anecdotal all day long. But based on what you're telling me about testosterone, like how does with the aggression factors, if somebody is transitioning and taking the proper medications and stuff like that does it tone down the aggression like should there be a fear of a trans woman in women's spaces from the aggression point of view okay so there's two things i want to say and this is very important and uh so the first thing about fear that i remember that i wanted to just talk about is fear about biological determinism fear mm. that if we offer up explanations for human behavior, particularly for male behavior that some people, you know, that may be troublesome, bad, I'll just say, um, then people, you know, will resist those explanations because it seems like it's validating the behavior and making it seem like, you know, A, it's okay because it's natural and B, there's nothing we can do about it. And I, without going into it, I'll just say both of those are obviously wrong. There's just so much evidence mm -hmm. that those two conclusions are unfounded and th therefore those fears are unfounded. They're reasonable. We can understand why people have those fears, but they're not grounded in reality. Um, the second thing that you're asking is very provocative. And yeah, some people are concerned about, um, you know, the larger issue, well, there's a few issues, but the, the larger issue 
is should trans women um, be able to, who identify, who may even be legally female because in, in, in the States we have self ID in some States. Mm -hmm. and, and this was um, a proposed bill in the UK where a, um, you know, it's not an issue for trans men. People don't, men don't seem to care if uh, trans men use their spaces, yeah. but um, I'll just say in this context, natal females, meaning um, biological females, uh, and women, there are um, natal females who want to preserve the right to have female only spaces like domestic abuse shelters, rape shelters, prisons, locker mm -hmm. rooms, places where they may feel vulnerable um, physically, but also just awkward. So there's another, you know, that's another part of it is they just not, they might just want to have a space with other women. Um, and the self ID laws allow someone to just, um, declare that they like a, a male, a natal male to be able to declare that he mm -hmm. is a, or in this case, I'll say she is a trans woman or she is in fact a woman and then would have access to female spaces. So my personal view is that, you know, 90 something percent of trans women are just people who want to live their lives as women are no threat to anyone yeah. and are, you know, just regular human beings who are not a threat to women. But that's almost separate from, well, how do women feel about their own, you know, right to their own spaces, right? So, mm -hmm. You know, but there is a lot of hysteria around um, trans women when most of them are just people who want to get on with their lives, right, and just live as women. But what you asked is, um, does the typical male aggression, and I would say it's not just physical aggression, it is a sexual nature that can be threatening to women. It is, it is in fact, men who do the 99% of the raping 95% mm -hmm. of the murdering, but that it is the, you know, sexual violence, sexual exploitation that is threatened, most threatening, right, to women. Uh, and that's a fear that is totally reasonable. And um, it is true that, in my view, this is a product of, um, first of all, different societies allowing the expression of that behavior. Mm. But I do think it's obvious that it's because of male typical levels of testosterone in utero in adulthood that shape men and their psychology. It does shape their sexuality in a way that is more intense and urgent than it is for women. And this is why men go to extraordinary lengths to get sex. Like they will ruin their lives, they will ruin <laughs> their reputations, they will torture, they will kill, they will kidnap, they will you know, go to lengths that are like, it's hard to explain why mm -hmm. they would construct their whole lives around being a sexual predator, right? It's because they're men. And I, I'm sorry to say that, but women don't typically do that. Yeah. Men do because sex is, has a different salience for men than for women. And that's, I would say, because of testosterone, it is the culture that can get, that can um, put the you know, reins on that, that can help men be incentivized to control the expression of that particular, those desires, mm -hmm. right? So laws, norms, customs, temperature, socioeconomic status, you know, job opportunities, mating systems, et cetera. Those things are all going to affect that. So for trans women, first of all, most men are not physically aggressive. Okay. I'm so, a teddy bear. So. <laughs> okay, so you have to start with that assumption, that observation. And it, again, this depends, this varies by culture, just how physically aggressive most men mm. are. But in the culture that we are in, most men are not extremely physical, physically aggressive. Um, most men are not violently raping and attacking women. So the concern about trans women, we have to remember, like, there's no reason to think that they're going to be more particularly violent, right? However, uh, so aggression levels, um, it's, so then you're not gonna see some huge decline in physical aggression when natal males block their testosterone levels because there wasn't a lot of physical aggression to start with. 
So when you look at the literature, literature to see what happens in trans women, there's not a huge amount of uh, decline in aggression. There's some reports of decline in anger, some reports of decline in physical aggression, but that's not the most robust finding. The most robust finding is that sexual desire goes goes way down that urgency for sex uh goes way down that's even you know you, you and these are people many times who will retain their male reproductive structure so they're still going to have a penis but in but i think some of the concern from some natal females about their spaces is in self id where trans women do not have to suppress their testosterone do not have to have any particular kind of surgery um can basically be fully intact natal males who declare themselves uh, as female and then have access to spaces that are um, typically women's spaces. So, you know, there's some understanding male sexuality and male aggression. If they're like completely unaltered, there is some fear that, uh, yeah, women could be extremely uncomfortable or even physically attacked. And I think that is something that's totally valid for discussion. You know, what are our laws going to be? People shouldn't be backing away from those discussions because they're afraid they'll be labeled transphobic, but that yeah. is what is happening. And that's a shame because that's interfering with people's rights. Everybody, you know, it, trans people have rights and women who have been abused and want to access a rape shelter without any natal males should be heard also. So I think here we do need discussions. Um, yeah. So sorry, that was a super long answer. I think it's a really complicated issue. I wish that we would stop the name calling. People have yeah. uh, the right to their opinion. Women have the right to say that they want their own spaces because if they don't really understand, also when you shut down discussion, you're not even going to hear the point of view from trans women who are like, look, I just want to use the women's bathroom. It's really awkward for me to go into the man's bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> People need to hear though what that is like, and they're not going to be sympathetic to those positions if the discussion is shut down. They're just going to be pissed off because people yeah. are calling them transphobic. Yeah, it just, you know, this is something I could talk about just for hours. Like, I, I just, it, it just bothers me that we live in this world where, where, you know, we shut down conversations. I'm like, they're conversations, they're words, they're, you know, these things, right? And we have balances, like where things aren't gonna, you know, there's a slippery slope argument. Well, if we talk about this, then that could turn into that. But it's like, I don't know, I look back and I'm like, you know, nine years ago, I was dying at 27 years old with congestive heart failure. I'm like, the last thing I'm worried about is a freaking conversation. You know what I mean? Like there's conversation, like, trust me, like when it comes to like my thing, I guess is addiction. There's plenty of areas where, you know, uh, uh, there's the guy, what's his name, Duarte in the Philippines who thinks you should just yeah, kill drug right. addicts. Yeah, and kill drug addicts. Right. Yeah. yeah, like there's crazy people out there and stuff. So that's something I'm very passionate about. But it's like, let's talk. And then if somebody gets a little crazy, then let's reevaluate. But anyway, like- yeah. It, no, I mean, I understand though, if, if you're a trans person who thinks that your rights are going to be diminished, if people mm -hmm. express certain views, then I can see, you know, how that's extremely threatening and how would you respond to that? So I, I, I get it, but what are we going to do? You know, I still think we need to be able to trust that people are working in good faith. But yeah. It's so difficult and, and you know what it is and i hate to get cheesy like it's just compassion right it's right. it's not just thinking about us like you're like you know we're talking about with like i know a lot of women who have been victims of you know uh sexual assault and violence it's like they should be able to express their concerns and you know we either comfort them with statistics and like you said like most you know most guys are not violent and stuff like that but I, I, I have a couple more questions and I think this next one is good for, you know, the, the bigger picture as well. And this is an old story, but can't remember if you touched on it in the book. Anyways, James Damore getting fired from Google. Yeah, no, right? I did, I did. Uh, oh, okay, cool. So as somebody who studies testosterone and nature versus nurture and all that, like, and, and the listeners who don't know, James Damore wrote this internal memo at Google that blew up saying there's biological difference between males and females and gender things and women aren't as likely to become programmers. I'm summarizing that. And he did kinda. say testosterone was one of the major yeah. reasons. Yeah. How no, I did my dissertation actually on um, sex differences in cognition and the role of testosterone. Yeah. So, how, but I left that mostly out of the book. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I'm very interested in that discussion. Yeah. How how accurate was what James Damore said? Did you read it? And you're like, oh, this programmer notes quite a bit about 
these differences and everything or we like eh, you know he he expressed his opinion but he's wrong and looked at the data incorrectly or you know whatever so because that's yeah, not his so, expertise no he basically in many ways recapitulated what larry summers had talked about in i think 2004 um at a mit conference about trying to understand uh the reasons why women are not more uh are underrepresented in stem fields mm -hmm. and so he proffered a few different hypotheses you know that women are the ones who have the kids and uh but discrimination which he thought was not as important as the lifestyle desires mm -hmm. and but he also suggested that there's a difference in the distribution of abilities which is a fact between uh, men and women so that for men for any almost any cognitive or even behavioral trait you're going to see a um distribution curve like this yeah it's kind of um low and relatively flat compared to women so if we're taking say uh, abstract reasoning or physics ability uh whatever underlying trait sort of uh, feeds into or supports uh, physics talent, right? And if you could measure that, you'll see this in men. So you see a lot more. So women would be more like this, right? Mm -hmm. So you just have a, the means could be the same. For many traits, the means are the same, but for many, they're slightly different. But what's really different is the pool, what Larry Summer said, the pool available at the high end. So you'll have more men who are really terrible at any particular thing, but more men who are really, really there on the very high end where the, even if the means are the same, if the, the female curves sort of peter out earlier than the male distribution curve, mm -hmm. right? So you will have more kind of genius physicists who MIT or Harvard might wanna hire. You'll have maybe five men for every one woman. Not because the mean is different, not because men overall are better at physics, but at that very high end where elite institutions mm. are hiring, you're going to see differences um, between the sexes. That is one thing. So that's one reason we might see these uh, differences in representation in STEM fields. There's a bunch of other factors that go into it. But another factor that James Damore was alluding to is interest. And that, and this is the case, and this does seem to be related to testosterone, that um, males want males prefer uh, careers and have interests that have more to do with things, messing with things mm -hmm. and figuring things out rather than that have to do with people and involve people skills and picking up on each other's emotions and talking. Um, that's a fact, right? These uh, interests exist across many cultures. And it is also true that, again, this might have a lot to do with prenatal exposure to testosterone. I think people underappreciate how important that is. And that has to be taken into consideration when you're thinking about transgender transitions. You're not changing the way that the brain has been permanently shaped mm -hmm. by testosterone or not in utero. So a trans man was not did not have high levels of testosterone in utero and a trans woman did. So even if you shut down your testosterone yeah. in adulthood, you still have a, some influences of that testosterone in utero. So um, it could, there is evidence that girls who are exposed to higher levels of testosterone in utero are more likely to have male typical career interests mm. as adults and are more likely to want to work with things or like be a truck driver or a plumber or something. And there might be social reasons for this too, um, but they're more likely to do that than girls who had typical levels of testosterone in utero. So mm -hmm. I do think James Damore was basically right that it might be that, hey, you know, we should not expect equality of outcome in every uh, profession. Nobody cares if there aren't a lot of women going into coal mining or the more dangerous professions, right? Mm -hmm. They're not flocking to those professions at all. And nobody cares. Even the more lucrative professions that are somewhat dangerous, people aren't trying to like get women into them like they are in STEM or coding yeah. or whatever. Um, so there is a difference in interest and uh, inclination there. And it might have to do with testosterone. It's perfectly reasonable to posit that there's a biological contribution here. That's what he did. And yeah, he got reamed. Um, just as President 
Summers did at the time when he was president of Harvard. He was basically forced to resign shortly yeah. after that. Uh, so you're not allowed to sit, have these views and express them publicly, which is bizarre to me because solving the cultural environmental problems isn't particularly easy. And of course, everybody should understand that most of these things are gene environment interactions and it's they're complex interactions there that underlie yeah. the patterns that we see. And it's not one or the other. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I just, you know, I just think it sets expectations when we're able to have these conversations and look at these things and all that. And, and, you know, like, like I just try to, I try to think scientifically as much as possible, right? And, you know, I dropped out of college. I'm no scientist, but I just try to look and I see all these like political, like the political kind of like what conversations we're having. But, you know, on the other side of it, if you look at the opposite person, there's something that comes up in a lot of books is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think even uh, in the coddling of the American mind, maybe they talk about the lack of conservative professors, right? And I recently had uh, 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 a professor on, and he's a conservative. And I was like, why do you think this is? He, he teaches philosophy. Where does he teach? Uh, uh, Not so in it, New England. No, no, no. no. It's, uh, it's in Pennsylvania. I don't know if it's okay. Penn State or what, but anyways. You know, we have like a minute, unless you're in the economics department, otherwise there's a very, very small, you know, proportion of, well, there, you know, you've seen these surveys, right? There's like hardly yeah. any conservative professors. Yeah. And and especially the administration is super, super liberal. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 just interesting because I think people can have these conversations if they recognize it because you know conservatives are like, hey, we're underrepresented. But one of the he had like three different hypotheses that get floated around, and one of them is being an educator doesn't pay that much, and conservatives are more likely to be driven by you know money right. and stuff right. like no, that. I've heard that. Yeah, yeah, and like I'm like, okay, well let's have this conversation. But it's funny because I think you could take people from different ideologies and. Yeah. They can they can actually co connect on this, right? And be like, hey, well, maybe this is possible, and maybe this is possible, and you know, there's a small you know, portion. That's true. And I wonder just to connect up with the um, Google thing and women's choices. Of course, there is also discrimination, and it's not even just blatant discrimination. It's like maybe it's just an uncomfortable environment for women. Maybe it's an uncomfortable environment for conservatives. And I think for conservative students, yeah. I know it is, because I've talked to students who are conservative who say they just keep their mouth shut in um, yeah. discussions. Some of them speak up, but they're the super brave ones. And I think that is a disaster because that just means that the kind of more progressive liberal ideas are just given free reign and nobody's pushing back. And that's what should be happening in the classroom. Yeah. So we need more conservative, you know, students and professors in my view. And, and it's just not the, the emphasis in diversity now is definitely not on viewpoint and political diversity. And we're doing some good things in terms of identity and um, ethnicity, et cetera. But I think there definitely needs to be more attention paid to uh, viewpoint diversity. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, I absolutely uh, agree. And I recently had uh, Bonnie Kerrigan Snyder from FIRE. I was just talk, telling you about that. But she yeah. talks about that uh, diver uh, view diversity in classrooms and student self-censoring. I think about that with like my 12-year-old son. I don't want him to not be able to ask questions or have you know these conversations. But anyways, Carol, one last question. And this this is kind of in the same realm of politics. And you, know, uh, you mentioned that you're your little clip went uh, viral from Fox News. And I've been really curious about this lately, not like just with, uh, you know, people who have these, uh, you know, uh, or research things that could be controversial. And I'm wondering, because I don't follow all of your interviews, I'm sorry, I love them, but I don't. Has, cons has, has liberal left-leaning media reached out to you as often or are they too scared? That's kind of my question. Well, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the reason that they have not is. And like the even, yeah, the Wall Street Journal reviewed my book and there, it was an amazing review that I was very pleased with. Um, New York Times would be great. Um, but <laughs> yeah, but it's been more sort of conservative uh, <sighs> podcasters. I, I mean, I don't think of like Joe Rogan as conservative. A lot of people mm -hmm. do. And many people have, were at least the ones who are, I heard from a lot of people who, you know, had a lot of positive emails from most of my appearances, but it, you know, it just, it's mostly on Twitter. Some people or Facebook or something just went after me from going on Fox news or going on Joe Rogan yeah. or, Vice or Andrew Sullivan. I'm fans of 
Barry Weiss, Andrew Sullivan, and Joe Rogan. Not because I agree with everything that they have to say. Just if yeah. hearing on the podcast doesn't mean I agree with all of their, you know, I'm sure they've said some things that I would be offended by. Yeah. But that they're out there having conversations. And that's what I want to support. They're curious. They're, you know, there's back and forth. Everybody's acting in good faith. Um, and the Fox News thing, I don't want to just sit here and preach to the converted. I want that audience to read my book. I think it's a great book. I think they'll be educated by it. And I think it will move things in the direction that I think they mm -hmm. need to go. I don't see why people like me shouldn't talk to like half the country or however many people watch Fox or voted for Trump. I don't care. I don't think they're bad people. Like yeah. that, I don't like that at all. I, I think we need to talk to people we, you know, who may be very different from us. And yeah. we that we have the moral high ground. Thank yeah, you. no, I, 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 I honestly get worried. Like the, the, my podcast, it is growing very well. And I'm like, cool, this is oh, awesome. Great. It's growing. I'm so happy but, for you. <laughs> oh, thank You've you. You've come but, a long way. You've come a long way and congratulations. I'm so glad you have this going right now. Yeah, it, well, part of it is because like you said, I am just so curious and I love having conversations and I'm just like, okay, Chris, but don't get too big because then people will be like, why did you platform this neo-Nazi transphobic racist? Yeah, whatever, like, get big, do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, but, okay. So like, just real quick on that, like, do you see it as like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So if we dial back and look at the big picture, right? So you have people shutting down conversations that you're trying to have about the science and the research and stuff like that. So now the only people who are interviewing you and giving you a voice are people that they're against. So you don't even get to talk to the other side and give them arguing points and facts and data. So it's kind of turning, it, it has the possibility of turning into what they don't want to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I hope that's not the case. I don't know exactly who is buying my book, but I've heard from all kinds of people. So I think okay. the book is sort of separate from uh, you know, you Twitter go. and yeah. podcasts. A lot of people have no idea what's going on. Don't listen to podcasts and don't know, you know what's going on there. But in a lot of ways, yeah, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's too bad. And if people just read the book, they'll, you know, it's there's nothing political. I don't think maybe a tiny bit. I don't, I don't know. I don't think there's really anything political in the book. I, did, I, I try didn't not get to, that. <laughs> to take a stance on too many social issues because I want people to just appreciate the science and then have that inform their views and discussions. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I'm not a biology guy. And I was like, oh, I learned quite a, I learned quite a bit. So you're an excellent teacher. So Carol, I... I am so happy that we we're able to link up and you're able to come on and chat about the I'm book. I'm sorry so, it took so long and I was so disorganized. You're, you're busy and busy is good. So what, where can people find you? And is the book, is the book out everywhere? Is it international? Can oh we find God. it? Oh, I'm trying to find, oh, I have the both. I have both. Um, oh. oh, all right. Oh, beautiful. This is the US one. Okay. This is the, U whoops, this is the UK one. It's being ah. translated into like 15 languages or something, which is very exciting. Um, very cool. Yeah, and if you like it, just do a review on Amazon. I, no, I uh, keep forgetting to ask people to do that. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, if you're in my audience and you read as much as I do, like leave the dang reviews on Amazon. They don't get it. Even though Bezos kind of sucks. People don't like Amazon, but yeah, you can get it. There are other, I'm at Hoovlet on Twitter. Yeah. Then, so There's a little link there that's not Amazon to get the book. Yeah. So are oh, and you... I have a, I have a um, website, carolhooven.com. I and did you can not get know it. that. So, so yeah, I'll be keeping up, but are you taking a break from writing books? Is this your one and only book? You have any plans to do something in the future or you, did you get it all out of your system? I don't know. I, it's hard. Writing it is. a book is hard. And if you have a kid, you know, it's like, it, it kind of interferes with the family time. So, yeah. And he said not to do it again. So me, I'll wait till he gets sick of me and then think about it. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Well, again, yeah. Carol, thank you so much. And Chris, and thank yeah. you. Yeah, and good we'll luck with time. the podcast. You're cranking them out. Are, is it like every day or how many are you doing? A yeah, week? it's been like, it's been like every day. So yeah, I read so, so much. You wanna keep go do you want to keep up that pace? I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. I, I yeah. got laid off earlier this month. So I have more I time to focus on this stuff. So okay. Who knows? We'll we'll see what the future holds. But uh, yeah, so everybody follow me too. So you so you stay tuned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow Chris. <laughs> All right, good. All right, thanks, Carol. Thanks so much.